tough question about the Iran deal on Capitol Hill. Everyone is going to be threatened by a preeminent terrorist state of America. My hope is that everyone in Congress evaluates this agreement based on the facts. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. Here are some of the media developments we've been tracking this week. The fight is on over the nuclear deal with Iran, and the airwaves are the battleground. The problems and the perils that journalists in Nigeria face when they try to cover the Boko Haram story. Western countries are planning to train some new recruits and open new fronts online in their propaganda war with Moscow. And overheard in the newsroom. Can you smell something burning? Yeah. My desire for journalism. Where the jaded and the cynical reign supreme. We begin with one news story and political battles being fought in two countries in which the media are playing a central role. There's been a lot of reporting about the sales job that President Barack Obama has on his hands in Washington in trying to win congressional approval for the agreement reached one month ago between Iran and the West over that country's nuclear program. There's been much less coverage of the Iranian angle and the challenges that that country's leadership is facing, with President Hassan Rouhani in the forefront and the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei less prominent but ultimately more powerful. Both the U.S. and Iran are home to skeptics, conservatives who argue that the risks in the agreement outweigh the benefits. However, while Iran can engage a press regulation mechanism that's accustomed to sanctioning outlets that step out of line, President Obama has no choice but to conduct a messaging campaign in the face of some hostile media outlets, as well as powerful lobby groups and even a PR push from an Israeli leader who argues that his country has a lot to lose from rapprochement. And the U.S. media have been more than generous in the airtime they've allotted to Benjamin Netanyahu. Meanwhile, Iran is showing signs of opening up to the international news media as part of a strategy to rehabilitate its image. However, dozens of journalists in jail there are evidence that the media are far from free. Our starting point this week is Tehran. There are many different views in Iran, and those who are skeptical are concerned about how the Americans would try to discover Iranian defense uh, secrets. We have the full gamut, really, in the United States of editorial opinion, and there's a tremendous uh, campaign now going on between those that are in favor and those that are opposed. There are parallels between opponents of the deal in American media and Iranian media. This rogue regime, what they have done in the past to Americans and people in the Middle East. This is about ideas. This is about ideology. And this is about playing the game the right way or playing the game dirty. The Iranian hardliners want to avoid it because they want to know. Because when you don't have facts on your side, you usually resort to fear. When a news conference by an American president is broadcast live in the U.S., it makes headlines. But on July 14th, when Barack Obama went out live on Iran's state-owned IRIB channel, it made history. It was a first, its significance underlined by the fact it was on a channel whose head is appointed directly by the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khamenei. In Iran's factionalized, chopped and changed media landscape, IRIB is home to the hardliners, and it was broadcasting a pro-deal message many conservatives did not want to hear. The live broadcast of President Obama's statements have been unprecedented. The Rouhani administration is trying to utilize their power within the media to sell this deal to the hardline camp. State television penetrates into portions of the society that are more conservative. The more liberal or urban population they watch these debates on Persian channels that are broadcasting from um, abroad into Iran. Iran's Supreme National Security Council put out an edict that said that media outlets really aren't permitted to criticize the deal. And I'm going to read you the do's and don'ts, okay? So, media should support the achievements of the nuclear talks, avoid spreading doubt or creating uncertainty or disappointment, emphasize American extremists and Israeli opposition to the deal, avoid printing news or analysis that would polarize society, and include the response by an Iranian official when quoting a Western official. So there you have it. 
Now, on the one hand, you could look at that and say, hey, that's great. That means that the Iranian system and the Iranian government is demonstrating a willingness to fulfill its commitments. But on the other hand, we were very critical of hardliners in Iran who used those same kinds of tactics to try and silence dissent. So I think we need to be equally critical of uh, attempts to silence media. The government wasn't um, ordering uh, people or newspapers or, or websites to uh, support the deal or to remain silent, but they were encouraging it, although that itself was highly criticized. And I don't think that uh, that had a very major effect because those outlets that, are, that were critical or highly critical, uh, I think, uh, continue to be uh, critical of the deal. But, as Iran watchers will tell you, the nuclear deal and the related end of sanctions were already popular with most Iranians. That official encouragement was largely unnecessary, but old government habits die hard. Iran has been heavy-handed in its treatment of international media outlets, denying many of them access and jailing some of their journalists. The Washington Post's Jason Rezaian has spent more than a year in a Tehran jail and his trial has been held out of the public eye. But Iran has recently reopened its doors to the BBC, albeit with strict limitations on reporting. And for the first time since 1979, it allowed a reporter from a Jewish pro-Israel publication, Forward Magazine, based in New York, into the country. He wrote, though I had to work with a government fixer, I decided which people to interview and what I would ask them. Far from the stereotype of a fascist Islamic state, I found a dynamic push and pull between a theocratic government and its often reluctant and resisting people. The article was widely circulated and was reported on by the New York Times. The focus that the new administration is having on the Jewish population is also a very strategic step. There's been a lot of talk as far as Iran being anti-Israel and anti-Semitic, and this is something that the new administration is trying to repair. We also should acknowledge that international organizations still rank Iran as one of the worst when it comes to media freedom in the world. They have a lot of journalists behind bars right now. So I think we should praise Iran when they move forward and take positive steps but we should also acknowledge that there's still a larger process in terms of media freedom and treatment of journalists inside of Iran uh, where improvement needs to be made. The Israeli subplot is much more prominent on the American side of this story. According to the Sunlight Foundation, which tracks the influence of money on U.S. politics, APAC, the pro-Israel lobby, is spending $20 million to defeat the agreement much of it on television ads. And Prime Minister Netanyahu has been all over the American airwaves. That's a palpable danger to the peace of the world. Making the same case. I wouldn't criticize the media for giving him a platform. Israel's view on this deal is perhaps the most important issue right now for many of those in Congress who are trying to decide how to vote. As long as they're sticking with the deal, we're solving a big problem, which and The Obama administration insists that this deal will actually be good for Israel's national security. And if the leader of Israel says that's not the case, that's news. I don't understand why media outlets give a greater level of visibility to the Prime Minister of Israel versus other foreign leaders. But there are facts and then there are distortions. The White House put the deal on the website for everybody to go and read. The White House has criticized lobbying groups like AIPAC for coming out against the deal and they're fudging the facts. And like President Obama has said repeatedly now, on the facts, the Prime Minister is wrong. The Obama White House has made the point that of all the world's governments to comment publicly on the nuclear deal, only one opposes it, Israel's. Next month's congressional vote will be a test of who has more influence with American legislators, a foreign power and its well-funded lobby, or America's own executive branch of government. And that is one angle to this story that no matter how the vote turns out, deserves more scrutiny by the media. On the download this week, our viewers on the coverage of the Iran nuclear story. The biased coverage of the Iran nuclear deal is evident in how the media sets the agenda of how this issue gets discussed by which guests it chooses to interview. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is frequently on the airwaves here criticizing the deal. However, we rarely hear from our own allies who help us negotiate this deal namely the foreign ministers of the UK, France, and Germany.
Iranians are not naive and you often see these in tweets and Facebook posts where people recognize, okay, the government has achieved a nuclear deal, but has the government achieved things like releasing former presidential candidates Mehdi Karoubi and Mir Hussein Mousavi? Other media stories on our radar this week. It's only half a million dollars, not a lot of money given the stakes in the propaganda war, but Washington is investing it in training Russian-speaking journalists in the Baltic states to contest the news narrative that's coming out of Moscow. U.S. embassies in Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia have unveiled a program called Investigative Journalism Training to Counter Russian Messaging in the Baltics. It's a 12-month investigative journalism program for young professionals working on Russia's periphery. According to the news release, as Russian propaganda and misinformation multiplies, the media in all three countries need the skills and tools to counter it with fact-based, credible news reporting. Similar media programs contesting Russian media narratives have recently been launched in EU countries. Just last month, Poland and Holland announced plans for something they call Content Factory, a Russian-language TV and radio news agency aimed at exposing misinformation coming out of Russia. Crowdfunding is becoming more and more common in journalism as traditional revenue streams dry up. And the whistleblowing website WikiLeaks is trying to crowdfund $100,000 in reward money to entice a source into leaking details on a controversial trade deal that no one has seen the paperwork on. Reduce barriers and costs. The Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TTIP, is a free trade agreement currently being negotiated between the EU and the US. The aim of the agreement, its negotiators tell us, is to create jobs and growth on both sides of the Atlantic by removing trade barriers. TTIP. Although the European Commission has released some videos and documents on what TTIP does. Here, your voice matters, however loud or quiet. It has not disclosed detailed information on what agreements are being discussed and the impact they will have on the public. Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, said the secrecy of the TTIP casts a shadow on the future of European democracy. Under this cover, special interests are running wild. The TTIP affects the life of every European. The time for its secrecy to end is now. So far, the crowdfunding effort has received more than $40,000 in just a few days. Among the pledgers, former Greek finance minister Yanis Varoufakis, Pentagon Papers whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg, and journalist Glenn Greenwald, to name but a few. We often report on how governments and politicians try to control or censor the news media. There are similar problems in the world of sports. And this past week, one of the richest football leagues in the world, the English Premier League, reached a deal with British newspapers and international news agencies, which is supposed to allow reporters greater access. A number of organizations have criticized some teams for banning reporters attending their press conferences. Luke Edwards of The Telegraph was banned by Newcastle United. And when Alex Thompson of Channel 4 wanted to query the club on the ban, he was banned as well. Well, now, the last people who ever banned me from doing my job as a journalist were the Assad regime in Syria. North of the border in Scotland, the BBC has announced it will boycott Glasgow Rangers matches after one of its journalists was banned by the club. This new agreement has been trumpeted as a way to ensure journalistic access, but it is not clear what guarantees are in place apart from a new mechanism for reporters to complain in the event that they do get bounced by a team that doesn't like their coverage. It's a big news story that we know very little about, the fight against Boko Haram, the militant group in Nigeria that's been blamed for one atrocity after another. Ever since 2009, when Boko Haram began its campaign of violence, the authorities in Abuja have struggled to contain the group and to tell the government's side of the story. The former president, Goodluck Jonathan, was often criticized for a failure to lead, at least publicly, on this issue. And the new president, Muhammadu Buhari, comes to office with a resume that includes a stretch in the 1980s when he was Nigeria's military dictator. And back then, Buhari had very little patience for the news media. The fighting has reached a stage where neighboring countries Niger, Cameroon and Chad are all getting involved. However, the northeastern territories of Nigeria, where Boko Haram is strongest, remain one of the most difficult regions in the world to cover, which leaves Nigerian news consumers with an incomplete picture of one of Africa's most deadly conflicts. The Listening Post's Nick Muirhead traveled to Nigeria to get a better understanding of the challenges that journalists face when trying to cover Boko Haram.
Of all the civilian deaths in African war zones last year, nearly half involved Boko Haram. But we'll probably never know the full extent of the violence, because despite journalists trying to get the facts, accessing them is nearly impossible. Boko Haram over the last six years have destroyed the, the telecoms infrastructure. They've just knocked down all the towers, blown them up. So you have to actually wait until the people who've managed to escape from these attacks tell you exactly what happened in person. For Boko Haram, it means that it is able to present itself as quite this monstrous, all-powerful behemoth, which isn't necessarily the case. There's a lot that we do not understand about this group, but it is pretty clear that this is a group that is very effective at exposing institutional weaknesses. These are people with no skills, no education, no resources, no military training whatsoever, that the Nigerian security services have failed over the last six years to infiltrate. So if the security services with all their machinery, with all their resources, cannot infiltrate an organization as fearful as Boko Haram, what do you expect of a journalist? As a consequence, they tend to cover Boko Haram from afar. In January this year, the group attacked the northeastern town of Baga, killing as many as 2,000 villagers, according to some reports, or 150, if you believe the Nigerian military. Our only window into the destruction came from satellite imagery, before and after shots of the burnt out village, which is why the death toll is unverifiable. But the story that exposed the government's communications shortcomings happened in April 2014, when more than 200 schoolgirls were kidnapped in Chibok. The then president, Goodluck Jonathan, did not speak publicly about the abduction for two weeks. And when his government did go on the record, it was all over the place, with various spokespeople giving journalists varying accounts. That's when Jonathan set up the National Information Center, headed by Mike O'Meary, who says the center provides one-stop shopping for the media to get the government's side of the story. International media coverage had a lot of inputs from varied sources within the country, including unofficial sources who were willing to stand before the television and just say anything. The good news for the girls is that we, can't, we, we know where they are, but we cannot tell you. So what we did was to set up the information center so that we can harness all the sources together and dish out what was credible, and that helped us to streamline the messaging. When it comes to reporting on Boko Haram, sources of information are limited. The area in the northeast where the group is active is virtually a no-go for the international media. So news agencies like AFP or Reuters are reliant on stringers or local journalists for information. The connectivity in the region is notoriously unreliable. So for the most part, that just leaves two other sources of information. Boko Haram propaganda posted online and the government here in Abuja. The government is now led by Mohamedou Buhari, who first came to power in 1983 after a military coup. Back then, he introduced something called Decree 4, which prohibited journalists from reporting information that the government deemed embarrassing. Although this time Buhari was voted into the presidency and has extended an olive branch to the media, he oversees an army that has a record of harassing journalists. The editor and a reporter of the Al Mazan newspaper in Kaduna were arrested in December 2012 after reporting that the military had committed abuses in the northeast of the country. The army also frequently confiscates newspapers in what its spokesman calls routine security action. And in March this year, on assignment in Maduguri, Al Jazeera correspondent Ahmed Idris and his cameraman Ali Mustafa had their equipment seized by the military and were confined to their hotel rooms for 10 days. We were accused of espionage, spying on our own country for a foreign government, and we are also charged with loitering in our own country. Later, a senior military officer told me that, look, we suspect you guys must have spoken to the leader of Boko Haram, Abu Bakr Shekau, or you are about to talk to that person. And that's the reason why we need to look at your camera. And that was when I realized that somebody somewhere is not happy with us being in my degree, and they will do everything to stop us from doing our job there. The Al Jazeera journalists say that they were arrested by the same military force that they had embedded with the day before, but they were able to return to Abuja, which cannot be said for the local journalists that they left behind.
who face the threat of Boko Haram and the danger of being affiliated with the group just by doing their job. So you had cases where some journalists um, who perhaps were aware of Boko Haram from the time that it was founded, from 2002, and had tracked this group and its evolution and have had people that it could speak to to understand the group. These journalists then became vulnerable to accusations that they were members of Boko Haram. So sometimes you have to balance between security and the accuracy of your reports. For local journalists, it's always difficult to come out and give the correct story without balancing the story from the official sources. Because without the official side of the story, he stands accused of playing into the hands of Boko Haram. So you find a lot of journalists, local journalists, cowed or intimidated into silence or even looking the other way when certain stories happen. Information is a rare commodity in the fight against Boko Haram, and the authorities are, in part, responsible for the scarcity of coverage. In June, Nigeria joined forces with neighboring Chad, Cameroon, and Niger to combat the militants. But in the words of the government's own spokesman, these wars are not won by bullets alone. And by failing to make the media its ally, Abuja may have aided its enemy. The ineffective uh, media strategy emboldened the terrorists because they now realized that less than credible information were being passed. And the insurgents who were on the ground knew I will realize that a state of fear and confusion has set in, so they feasted on it, and so they were regular also in dishing out information that will elicit con confusion. When you put together um, the lack of communication from the authorities who are supposed to be dealing with this problem, and you add that to the danger of getting to the parts of the Northeast that are affected, it's like a ghost war of something that's happening up there. The lack of on-the-ground reporting makes this conflict seem like a ghost war, but it is brought home too frequently on the faces of too few survivors, haunted by their experiences. The real victims in this fight, who escape with tales of misery, stories that too often go untold. Finally, the things you hear in a newsroom. Maybe it's the pressure of the job, maybe it's the deadlines, maybe it's just that there are a lot of frustrated comedians in our midst. But spend some time eavesdropping on editors, photographers, or reporters, and you have a comedy script in the making. Which is why Overheard in the Newsroom, a website where journalists can post the exchanges they hear at work, has built a huge following on Twitter and on Facebook. The site was set up six years ago by an American graphic designer named Kevin Cobb. We decided to take a few of those online exchanges and throw them on the screen. There's some standard newsroom fare, a heavy helping of sarcasm, a few dollops of cynicism, and a spoonful of salt. Let's see if you recognize any of your good work. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Oh, hey, nice story today. I read the whole thing. Hey, you may want to take down the breaking news banner. It's been on the website for two weeks. The story's ready. I just need a source. Should I try and make this piece happier? You see, this is what happens when a crime reporter covers Father's Day. Well, first of all, we don't control Google. I managed to avoid the terms election fever and hotbed of democracy. Do you know what? I'm just going to transfer you to my voicemail. I could get one of the, the interns to do that. How dare you? Can you smell something burning? Yeah. My desire for journalism. You're not God. No, but I am your editor. Uh, I know if I procrastinate long enough, a story will come through. And exactly what awards they want to give you? The Control C, the Control V award for publishing government press releases. <laughs> Hello, cemetery. This is the newspaper. We're not dead yet.